Today our topic of discussion would be the learning on the homeopathic facial analysis. Dear doctors, this is I feel very immense pleasure to uh, have this webinar on this homeopathic facial analysis. Uh, I believe that today you are going to learn something very unique on the miasmatic aspect. Today we are going to discuss on the homeopathic facial analysis. On the behalf of Homeopathic Academy and Beijing group of companies, I extend a warm welcome to our extreme guest speakers. Uh, Grant and Louis Bentley, who will be enlighten us on the topic homeopathic facial analysis. So I welcome you, Grant and Louis, uh, on this platform. And dear doctors, if I, uh, you all are very much known about them, let me just briefly introduce you both. Dr. Grant is the principal of Veterinarian College of Classical Homeopathy. He is a qual qualified homeopath, naturopath from the Melbourne, Australia. He has studied the clinical hypnosis and has a postgraduate diploma in Ericksonian psychotherapy. He has been working and studying in various fields of natural therapy since 1987. In the late 90s, Grant became a research project on facial structure and mias and uh, introduced a project. This project uh, became a new homeopathic methodology known as the homeopathic facial analysis. And since its development, HFA has been taught to be both graduate and postgraduate students all around the world. Uh, he has done various uh, uh, works in the form of literature. So you can see uh, there is Appearance and Circumstances 2003. There is a homeopathic facial analysis. Uh, then Soul and Survival book is there. Then uh, How Aphorism 27 Changed the World. Pandas Reaching Out a Natural and Homeopathic Approach. So you can go through his various literature. And I believe that it would assist you in the practice a lot. Let me also make you aware about uh, Louis Bentley. So Louis assisting Grant in... Uh, uh, in this homeopathic facial analysis methodology and she is training manager at Victorian College of Classical Homeopathy. Uh, Louis Bentley is from Melbourne, Australia and has been working as a homeopathic practitioner since uh, 1996. Uh, she has focused her experience towards the homeopathy and developed and researched HFA and its training application. Uh, collation application of miasmatic diagnosis, uh, production and editing of the five HFA books by Grant Bentley, development of HA software facial analysis, coordination development, dissemination of the HFA online course. So there are various literature which you can go through of uh, Louis Bentley. And now without wasting much time, I request Grant and Louis to take up it from here and please guide the audience. Hello and welcome to this webinar on HFA and uh, this is my wife Louise. Um, Louise will be doing, because it's a training seminar, Louise will be doing most of the, the training. I'll come in at the end as well to answer a lot of questions. I usually do the more of the theory and the philosophy and because we're trying to make this as practical as possible. Um, the, we're going to try and cover as much of the HFA system as what we possibly can. Now, I mean, we all have one thing in common, don't we? We as homeopaths, we all want to get good, good results. And the only way that you can do that is to get consistency with that result. In order to do that, you need to have a method. And this is where HFA has really served us. Um, I've been in homeopathy now for close on 30 years. I know what it's like at the beginning where you get that one, one success story amongst a sea of people who are kind of get lukewarm responses. You get 49 people who don't respond and then just when you think that you, you've chosen the wrong profession, you get this one person who comes in tells you how wonderful that they feel and then you're rejuvenated again and the fire starts and you get back into the whole system. But what we've got to do is we've got to be able to turn that once, uh, that very rare success into um, a very rare, you know, where most of our successes are, you know, that 80% level and above. I mean, of course, we're not going to get everybody that comes into our clinic, but if we can get the majority of our patients to a level that both we and they are happy with, then that's a, that's a great thing because it gives you the confidence that we're all looking for. 
but that confidence doesn't come on a wing and a prayer. This is something that only can occur if you've got a system in place. And that's exactly what HFA is. It is a system in itself. And it's a lot more than just the facial analysis, even though we will be focusing on that. It is more than that. It's the way that we repertorize. It's the way we structure into a hierarchy of importance the, the symptoms that are to be repertorized. And it's the case management. Now, most of you, if we go through, if you, if you have a look at our, um, at the recording cl recorded classes that we've put down um, already, you'll notice that a lot of what we do in the way that we select rubrics, the way that the hierarchy that we put them into, the case management structure, you can see Herring's Law, you can see Hahnemann and so on. So there's nothing particularly new in that. But what we do do is we make sure that we don't stray off track because it's the practitioners like Hahnemann and like Herring that got homeopathy to the place from obscurity to, to uh, a me medicine that took on the world. And, and I don't want to just bypass that. I want to incorporate that. So HFA is about incorporating uh, a, an addition to traditional Hahnemannian homeopathy. Once we have the system in place, that then gives you the confidence to be able to apply the HFA method. I, I sometimes have, with a little bit of amusement, that I'll see webinars with homeopathy for difficult cases or homeopathy for complicated cases. But the reality is, is that homeopathy, if your system is right, it should be the same system, whether or not you're dealing with a complicated case or a, a simple case. I mean, for Hahnemann, the bottom line is the similimum. How we get to that similimum should be a process. And that process of finding that similimum should be the same whether or not you're looking at a case of uh, allergic rhinitis or whether or not you're looking at a case of psychosis. Now, obviously, the two pathologies are completely different and just as obviously the management program is and the prognosis is going to be entirely different. Um, but what I'm saying here is, is that the methodology for finding that similimum is, is the same. So one of the things I just want to touch on is I want to just touch on getting homeopaths back to this concept of the physical body because homeopathy is all about individualization. And we have gone off uh, on a little bit of a tangent in the idea that individualization comes from the mentals alone. It's our, it's, it's, it's not, after all, when you look at the physical body, I mean, the lungs do the same job, the liver does the same job in every person, the kidneys do the same job in every person. There's no individualization in this. So we've always gone down the pathway that the individualization lies in personality and the mentals. Now, I don't know how many people there are out there because I can't see you, I can only see the screen. But you can almost, when you talk about individualization of personality, if I got everybody to stand up out of their seat, for example, and I'm going to ask two questions. The first question is, everybody sit down who doesn't love their family. And of those who are still standing, I want everybody who prefers financial insecurity to stay standing and those who prefer financial security to sit down. Now, if there's a hundred of you out there, then I'm sure that nearly every single one of you is sitting down by now. And that is that is with just two questions only. So it's not always about that the mentals individualize and the physical body doesn't. 
after all, that's kind of missing the forest for the trees here because when you look at the physical body, you're also talking, what about DNA? What about cellular markets, fingerprints? And the other thing is your face. It's all very individual. And that's what we're trying to achieve because that's what homeopathy is. The individualization of the patient to match that remedy. So we're looking at this special uniqueness. We're looking at not what the liver does, but the almost the, the fingerprints, the things that we can see that are indicators of individuality and nothing is more individualized than the face. And in homeopathic history, and it still does continue, there's a lot of tongue diagnosis. There is diagnosis of the miasms via the fingernails. And the fingernails aren't even, dis aren't even really there for expression. Whereas our face is actually there for expression. You can't, if you've got a crowd of, you know, you're amongst 10,000 people, you're going to a concert or you're going to a sports event, you know somebody immediately the moment that you see their face. And this is because uh, they are, the face is designed to be our outward demonstration of how we feel and who we are. It is a uniqueness about it. So I understand about the mentals, and in fact, like I've got here in aphorisms 2, 10 and 11, that changes in demeanour are an important guide to remedy selection. It's also important to understand that Hahnemann means changes in demeanour. It means a normally, um, say, a shy or retiring person who suddenly becomes aggressive and jealous. Not an aggressive or jealous person by nature. But that change is, is what he says is really important. But what Hahnemann says is most important is in selecting a remedy is the PQRS. And we do this by not just the physical generals, but we need the PQRS, as Hahnemann talks about, are all of those modifying factors of the illness, the modifying factors of the pain, what we would call the modalities, all the things that make it better or worse. And then we, what you'll notice is that we put in special emphasis on the modalities because Hahnemann said that the BQRS is the most important symptom. Now, most of the time we sort of say a, a PQRS symptom is the square stool of sinicular or the cornstalk fiddle of calc fleur playing in their head. But it's more than that. It doesn't have to be just strange. It is anything that modifies a general complaint. And if you watch it, uh, like I said, what you'll notice is in the system of HFA, there is particular emphasis on repertorizing with modalities. So if the, I, I have absolutely no problem with physical concepts like uh, tongue diagnosis or with fingernail diagnosis and so on. I guess all I'm saying is that how much more can we expect in our accuracy of miasmatic diagnosis from the fingernails by comparison to something that's designed to be expressive like our face. Our face is designed to convey our internal energy to the outside world. It shows other people when we're happy, when we're sad, when we're upset, when we're angry. That's its role. And so, in some degree, so you can sort of say, well, you know, why hasn't homeopathy gone down this pathway? Well, it, it kind of has. It, it, look, I didn't want to just wake up one morning and look at my diary and say, look, I haven't got anything to do today. I might invent HFA. HFA is a, a system that has taken 10 years to develop. I wish I could say it was foolproof, but HFA is not for fools. It takes finesse and it takes wisdom. But 
I guess that's the same as anything in life, isn't it? I mean, if you anything that comes easy really doesn't have a whole lot of value. So you do have to put effort into this. Every line, every feature, every sort of asymmetry is all being measured and quantified and put into a miasmatic category. So as I said earlier, I mean, what it does do is that it makes HFA as a model that is as observational as possible. It is objective. The, there's no problem with the mentals as such, as opposed to the generals. The problem with the mentals, though, really la lies in this very well seen is this part pulsatilla that's a little bit like lycopodium, that's a little bit like Natma. But like the analogy that we did when we're waiting for our friend at a sports event, there's 10,000 other people and you, you notice them straight away. There's no speculation there. It is there. It is solid. And as a result of that, HFA gives you incredible confidence as, as a practitioner. And that's what I meant by when I, the homeopathy for difficult cases or as if that for some reason there's something special that you have to do for difficult cases, you don't. As long as you know the methodology for finding the similament, you have to follow that, of course. Management will be a little different, but the finding of the similament stays the same. Once you've got confidence in the system, you apply it no matter what the condition. The HFA method is essentially an extension of Hahnemann's three primary miasms. He talks about how they can combine into... Um, the tubercular miasm, the multi-miasm of cancer, pseudosaura, psychosyphilis, and so on. That's how we get the seven miasms of, of HFA. And every single person, in fact, every single thing in the world will fit into one of those seven miasms. And essentially what it is, the process of how it works, is that every single person with through one of these miasmatic energies has a way of being able to re-establish balance in the body, to re-establish order, to try and bring themselves back into unity. And if we can select a remedy with the same resonant energy that the bot that person in in our clinic also has our patient then we double up on their body's ability or the vital forces ability to be able to re-establish order and that's why homeopathy works so well and so quickly but you've got to be able to get that right resonance how many times before hfa i would and i'm making this up as i go along but how many times I would have done a good, good repertorization and you'll have sulfur or thuya or mercury up the top and I'll give sulfur because it reads perfectly, it repertorizes well and then you give it and it either doesn't work or it causes an aggravation and you, our homeopathic historical books are full of aggravations or when the right remedy fails to relieve and so on but me personally, I believe this is because we just got that resonance of energy just slightly wrong. If our patient is psychotic and we can tell that from their facial features, then we should have chosen Thuya instead of the, the sulfur. And that H HFA allows you to know that I can bypass the sulfur and get straight to the Thuya and so as a result of that, we double up on the body's energy. So I said earlier, well, it, if we can come up with the fingernails, how come we couldn't come up with uh, something simulating HFA a little earlier? Well, as a matter of fact, we were on the road to that. We were, when you have a read of Allen and Roberts and Forbester, 
they're all making reference to facial structure and the imprint of the miasms on facial structure. What HFA has done is that it's taken that as our starting platform and then we've developed it based on these original writings. So what I'm going to do now is let you, I'm going to hand it over to Louise because she's a better trainer than I am because I have a tendency, as you probably noticed already, to go off on tangents. So she'll keep you in the straight line and she'll show you everything about HFA and what facial analysis is all about. For what I will do is just that I'll come back at the end um, for when you, if you've got any theory questions that you would like to ask, and I'm more than happy to answer them then. So, over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Grant. That's great. Okay, so hello, everybody, wherever you are in the world, and morning or maybe uh, afternoon, as we are here in Australia, it's the afternoon. And um, thanks for taking the time to listen to us and what we have to say about homeopathic facial analysis. So I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview from a training perspective and hopefully um, inspire you to learn more. So first of all, um, back in 2018, we were invited to come to India. Uh, the Homeopathic Academy and B. Jane uh, wanted classes from leading homeopaths to help graduates extend their education. We've been in the education business. Our college has been running since 1989 um, and we've been involved since the 1990s. So we know a lot about homeopathic education. And uh, so in 2019, about just over a year ago now, we went to Delhi and we spent a couple of weeks there and we recorded 20 classes. Okay, Grant recorded 10 classes. We wanted to separate the reality that Grant has these unbelievable skills in understanding homeopathy. He developed the HFA methodology. He recognizes the philosophy behind it and how it links to all the great masters. And he's developed a really fantastic case management system for clinical use. Um, my focus has been particularly on the face, uh, teaching students how to do facial analysis and how to incorporate that in their cases. So we thought the best way to present this information was to split it into two sections. Both of them are important, both need to be done, but they are slightly different. So 10 classes from Grant and 10 from myself. Okay, now the question is, why would you learn any new method at all? Um, and I think thinking this through, the answer is that patients really deserve the best that we have to offer them. Um, and you also deserve to become a confident practitioner in quite a short period of time. We have trained many people from fully through the undergraduate stage of homeopathy, or we've taken them on when they've trained at other places but they want to learn HFA. And within quite a short period of time, usually between two and six months, you can become really quite proficient at homeopathy by incorporating the facial analysis. And homeopathy, we all know, can be difficult. It really can be quite difficult. We've all been there from our young student days through to early graduate and perhaps even when we're experienced. Um, but HFA definitely has made homeopathy easier for us. Um, we find it to be quite reproducible and effective. We can train people in it and we can practice it ourselves. We use it for chronic cases um, and we also use this methodology to build immunity during acute phases of illness. So because I'm coming from the training perspective, it made me really think about the many years that I've been involved with homeopathy, um, which is well over, um, I can't even do the maths now, but it's coming up to 30 years, so it's been a long time. And, uh, and we've all, like all of you out there, learned all the different methods of how to find the remedy. So just in reviewing some of those methods, you can learn from the mind, you can learn remedies via essence, you can learn all about the miasms, and I have been told there are more than 200 interpretations of miasms worldwide. Um, there's the layers way of practicing and understanding what's going on. There's a big focus on repertorizing. You've got your materia medicas. There's a lot of philosophy to learn. There are remedy pictures and keynotes. You can look at generals or you might focus on specifics. Then, of course, there's the pathology. 
and uh, some people like routines and other people like more focus on the individuality. But there's a lot there that we learn about. And then we ask the question, well, what is right and what is wrong? And the reality is that every aspect of these instructions has some fundamental truth. We've seen truth in all of these things. But if you compare and contrast each of these methods, you'll start to notice that there are many gaps and there are contradictions. So we ask ourselves, why would this be so? And I think the answer that I've come up with, this is just my personal answer, is homeopathic remedies are energetic memories of substances. And they're quite difficult to differentiate. And they're very difficult to measure. And we can't really even know what's in our bottle. We trust that the manufacturer has put the actual remedy into the bottle the way it's put down on the label. Really with remedies, it's only after they are given that we can see their effect. And we can only see that via approving or in the clinic. That's all we really know about our remedies in the end. So we have these three processes. We have provings, we have the repertories, and we have materia medicas. Now, of course, as we all would know, um, even from first year student, you know that approving is a random collection of information about a particular remedy that we know about after it's been tested on people. We go through the proving process and we get that information. Then we've got our repertories where there's a lot of collective data that is allocated via symptom allocation. So we can have one rubric with many, many remedies in it representing that one symptom. Then we've got our materia medicas. Now they're generally summaries of a remedy. They're parts of the remedies data or they might be a personalized view that's written by um, a practitioner based on one or maybe a few patients or just a summary from the provings. Okay, so, so we're looking at provings, repertories and materia medicas. And the question now becomes is which is easier to work with? And our answer through our experience is the repertories, much easier to work with. And so the reason they're better, they stand above the provings, they stand above the materia medicas, our repertories, is because they provide a collective data of all the symptoms that have been allocated for that particular remedy, all sorted, all collated for you. It probably pre 1990s was really harder to use the repertories because they were big books and it took a long time to repertorize the case. But since we now have computers, and that's why we're all sitting here now, able to talk to each other right around the world, even though most of us are in lockdown, the reality is, is computers have completely opened up the world of homeopathy via repertories and homeopathic software that allows us to repertorize. So that's what that's one of the big things we've learned along the way is we've really focused on how to repertorize. That's a big part of our clinical process. Then we just look at this general concept of what is chronic illness. And we look at it that everybody is born with some weak areas in their body. Generally one, sometimes two, or even more, either weak organs or weak body areas. And then stress occurs. It might occur early in life or it might take many years before stress comes along. And it, stress comes in various forms. It could be physical stress or just energetic or perhaps emotional stress. And then when that stress occurs, the weak part of our body begins to show stress and then the symptoms appear. And this is what we're familiar with as homeopaths. We then look for that remedy, that simil um, similar that's going to resonate with the body, that's going to rebalance and relieve the stress in the body. And then we see that the symptoms begin to lessen, particularly where the stress still remains. We still may see a little bit of them, but they'll lessen a lot. Uh, or what we might get complete removal of the symptoms when there's no stress there anymore. The only job if the, of the homeopath is to find a remedy for the patient that brings them back to health. That's our only job. And our aim is to find the quickest, the deepest acting and the most gentle acting remedy. And from the HFA perspective, that is a remedy that resonates to both the totality of the case and the miasm of the case. So because we've been really focused on HFA now for 20 years, and we're aware there are so many different other ways of applying homeopathy, we ask ourselves this question. 
Should we learn a lot of different methods when we're students? The answer is yes, we really should um, learn a lot of methods. That's the job of a student, to explore the foundations and all the diversity that the um, area they're studying has to offer. Should we thoroughly test the method that we most understand and want to use for clinical application? And the answer is yes. We really need to be a master of one method, not understanding at a light level many methods or even mixing them all together, going from one method to another or mixing a bit of this and a bit of that. Bit of that. It's really important to choose the method that works for you and a method that you understand, a method you can apply and become a master of that method. Okay, so the question now becomes, why would you even look at HFA? And we go back to that list that we showed you before on how all of us learn homeopathy from the mind, through the essence, the different versions of miasms, layers, repertorizing, materia medica, philosophy, remedy pictures, keynotes, general specifics, pathology, routines, and individuality so many ways to find a remedy. HFA only looks at two of these areas. Of that list, I think there's 12 items there, we only look at two. We link two together and through using those two areas in a very consistent way, we find deep, fast-acting remedies. Okay, so we'll, we'll go on to that in a moment, but I just wanted to remind you of the work that Grant did from 1999, and I joined him at that time, so I've been pivotal with Grant in this development of HFA. And he was really only just looking at a personal definition of a miasm and a way to use a miasm clinically that he felt would enhance his clinical results. And he's come to the conclusion that a miasm is a defensive mechanism of the patient that works with the remedy and the patient's own restorative power to rebalance them and to remove their symptoms. And then when we add on the repertorization via the generals, we come up with a formula which is miasm plus totality via the repertorization is two methods that we join together to find the one remedy. So looking back at our list again, we've highlighted the two areas. So out of that list, we do look at miasms, but only via facial structure. This is um, method number 200. The other 199 are quite different, and it's really important you don't mix them, mix them up together because they really are quite different. They're all interpretations. Hahnemann spent 12 years. He wrote The Chronic Diseases. He gave us a beautiful foundation to start our work on miasms but it wasn't complete. And that's why at least 200 methods have developed around the world because many homeopaths have recognized this and they've tried to do more with what they fundamentally understood were good basic principles that Hahnemann had outlined as we do. Um, and then we add on the repertorizing with the focus on generals and modalities. And these are our two areas of homeopathy that we become really good at. We're experts in these two areas, facial structure, and repertorizing with generals and modalities. And using these, this, these two methods alone from that very comprehensive list, we get great results. Consistent, deep, fast-acting remedies. Okay, so we'll look at the face just a little bit. We could talk for hours about the face. It's been a 20-year journey that started off with just some ideas from Alan and Roberts and Forbester. Um, and just went further and further. And once we understood some of the fundamentals, it, it started to uh, unroll quite quickly. A little bit like Hahnemann when he did, did his proving of China. Um, he didn't know he was going to discover homeopathy. He was just curious. And then all of a sudden it just unrolled for him. And that's what happened with HFA with us. So we look at the face because as Grant said, the internal energy within the patient, within all of us is represented by our external structure. Um, these are quite simple forms of structure and what we've discovered is the face is a lifelong blueprint for our defence mechanism. And even as the face changes with age, and over the 20 years we've definitely noticed, um, we look in the mirror, all of us do change with time, but that blueprint remains the same. And we have looked at childhood photos, elderly photos, and that blueprint is always there from the youngest baby we've ever chosen their miasm for is four days old through to patients in their 90s. That blueprint is there. You just have to know how to read it. So this is just an example of three 
forehead shapes. Very simple, this is common, everybody has a forehead shape. Sometimes you have a singular shape like this and sometimes you'll have a multiple of two shapes, but the shapes are very simple. So the one on the left is just a slope that is straight. The one in the middle is a straight shape that is vertical and the one on the right is a curved shape. So you just start getting used to this idea of looking at shape and structure. We created the Miasm model. It took us about three years to do this because like everybody, we had been open to many different miasmatic models and they have different um, miasm interpretations, different numbers of miasms, lots of um, differences there. So by 2003, Grant was absolutely convinced for this model that we use, there are seven miasms. We work from the three primary miasms. They are the core that we start with, Sora, Psychosis and Syphilis, which are the three points on our triangle. Then we have the duo miasms. We're all familiar with the tubercular miasm and um, a lot of the Indian homeopaths are familiar with Psychosyphilis and Psychosora. And then of course we have the one trio miasm, which is the cancer miasm, which we place in the middle because it links to the three corner points. So every miasm links to one of those three primary miasms, whether you belong to a primary miasm or a duo miasm or a trio miasm. Every person, every substance belongs to one of those seven miasms. Okay, we've been asked this question because colours are not new to miasmatic allocation and um, Ortega talked about them in his book in 1977. But Ortega's work, as many miasmatic models, are really based around pathology, but our model is based around directional force. It is not the same. We've learned that as we go along, there are crossovers that are the same, but there are differences. <clears throat> this directional force is what forms all matter, and it forms the shape of matter, the size and the angles. In essence, your face. Uh, so we gave the colour yellow to Sora because we see Sora as outward motion. Um, it's the energy that's linked to the sun. The sun is a perfect example of outward motion and the sun is in essence yellow. Red is given to psychosis. We see psychosis as circular motion. The universal energy that we would link to psychosis would be cycles, the cycles of the planets, the cycle of our planet. And blue is what we give to syphilis for inward motion. And we see that the universal energy of inward motion or syphilis or blue is gravity. These are ideas that we developed after we saw it clinically working. It was kind of like the philosophy, the interpretation came after we saw this was working. What was the reason behind it? And Grant talks about that extensively in his book, Soul and Survival. Okay, so now we ask the question, is there a link between pathology and the directional forces? And generally, we would say not really. There may be some slightly increased trends between some pathologies and some miasmatic groups, but not enough to choose remedies. They're only, they're only trends, they're not absolutes, and you always get patients that fall outside of the trend. So we really want absolutes, that's what we're after. So we've done many, many cases over the years, cancer, skin cases, digestive, nervous system, lungs, autoimmune behavior, all sorts of um, cases as they've, as they've presented. And we've had them from all seven groups, all seven miasms. So we've made the decision that the pathology is not a strong enough indicator, even though there might be a general trend. We want absolutes. Okay, but here's something that I think all homeopaths agree on from Hahnemann to, 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 to today is that sulfur is a dominantly soric remedy and thuya is a dominantly psychotic remedy and mercury is dominantly syphilitic. And we agree with that. We find that in our clinics, we have allocated sulfur to Sora or yellow. We have allocated Thuya to uh, psychosis or red, and we have allocated the remedy mercury to syphilitic or blue. And consistently where the face matches the miasm, those remedies, if, they're, if they repertorize for the case, work really well. So let's just have a look at the idea of some rubrics that we'll see in our repertories that are based on miasms and pathology. So we pick, there are actually rubrics for Sora. So let's have a look at the rubric Sora and you'll see there that mercury, sulfur, 
and Thuya all come under the Soric rubric, which can be really confusing. Uh, we look at the rubric psychosis. We also see mercury, sulfur, and thuya coming up under the rubric psychosis. Uh, we then look at syphilis and we see mercury and thuya and sulfur as well. So there are clearly crossovers. We've all noticed this already. Our repertories tell us this is so. We can then go to pathology. We might look at a pathology like eczema that traditionally is linked to Sora. But we see mercury, thuya and sulphur with many other remedies have been used to treat eczema successfully. We see the same with watts, traditionally linked to psychosis, but we see that mercury, sulphur and thuya also come under the rubric warts. And then we ultimately go to ulcers, which traditionally is all about syphilis, but we see mercury, thuya and sulphur there too. So all, the, all this, we can see straight away that there are, um, there are links there are, sorry, there are over crossovers between the myosins and pathology. So now we ask the question, are our repertories wrong? And the answer is no, they're not wrong at all. They're incredibly useful. Are our rubrics wrong? No, they're not wrong. Um, is pathology linked directly to some myosin models? Uh, yes, yes, it definitely is linked to some. Is pathology linked directly to all myosmatic models? And no, the answer would have to be it is not linked to all of them. Are there links between pathology and remedies that are patient dependent? Yes, definitely is the answer to that question. So our conclusion is not all myosin or pathology models are the same. And we know that because this HFM model works really well and we'll show you how. So we've just briefly covered directional force via facial structure. That equals our myosin in the HFA method. And this highlights which group of remedies will be best for our patient. We have uh, tested many of the polycrests and we have determined which myosin they belong to. Um, then we repertorize and phase one of our repertorization narrows down remedies into a broad group which covers our totality. Then we use the facial analysis to determine which myosin the patient belongs to. And then we apply the myosin filter which filters out the remedies that don't belong to our myosin. In HFA, as we've pointed out, we have seven miasms, all based on directional forces. We have tested around 70 remedies, which we've allocated to one of those seven groups, and we have about another 50 remedies that are under testing. So sulfur is always given to patients with sorically dominant facial structure where the totality matches. Thuya is always given to psychotically dominant facial structure where the totality matches and mercury is always given to syphilitically dominant facial structure where the totality matches. We use mainly polycrests. We get great results with them. We've come to learn that polycrests have very broad application potential. As you would expect, sulfur alone has more than 15,000 rubrics, um, 15,000 symptom presentations. So all these remedies have a lot of potential Okay, <clears throat> so now we'll just look a little bit at the face. So um, we're just looking at Sora to start with, and this is an example of how facial structure and directional force come together. So we've noticed, and we've tested this over and over for 20 years, that Sora, the Soric facial structures are generally sloped, they're small, there are multiple lines, and they're quite aerodynamic in their presentation, which is representative of outward motion. Psychosis, our red group, we've noticed larger features, more full, rounder, straighter. This is representative of the circular motion. And with the syphilitic features, we've got, um, which is our blue group, they're more crooked, curved, sharp or upward, which is representative of inward motion. The other four miasms are additions to primary miasms. Okay, so all features are allocated from the three primary myosins, and we'll give you some examples. So let's just look at some examples of facial structure with soric or yellow uh, directional force. These are the sloped or small, multiple lines, the aerodynamic um, features that you would expect where outward motion is dominant. We won't cover what dominance means in this particular webinar, but it's an important concept that we have worked out and we use within the HFA system. So on the left sketch, you will see the 
uh, hairline shape which is M-shaped and that or a widow's peak in some uh, cultures it's called and that is a yellow or soric feature just one feature it doesn't mean the whole person is soric it's just one feature and we add those features up the second example this person has very full eyelids that's also a soric feature and the third example is the multiple lines on the forehead, particularly seen when the face is in expression, the eyebrows are raised or the person is talking or laughing. These are just examples of many of the facial features that we explain in the HFA course. Okay, so then we have some examples of psychosis or red facial features that tend to be larger, fuller, rounder or straighter. <clears throat> and this is because circular motion is behind those forces. So we have an example of a hairline shape that is an arc shaped, which is part of a circle. We have the example of quite large mouth um, with full lips as well in that particular example, which is a psychotic feature. And we have the example of a single line. Things that run through the middle of the face tend to be um, psychotic features where they come in a single straight line. And then we have the syphilitic features and here's just a few examples the crooked hairline on the left or the example in the middle of the recessed um, eyelids this is one point for blue or syphilis and the dimples where we've got the inward motion drawing back into the cheeks on one side or both that's one point for syphilis and you'll see that in some of your patients Within the HFA system, we've allocated 75 features to the three primary myosins. We have a formula which is based on dominance where we can find the dominant patient myosin because we pretty much all have all the myosins showing on our face, but there will be a dominance. This method is clinically reproducible. You can teach it to someone once they understand it and apply it properly start getting some really good results. We've seen it from very early on students doing quite what Grant allured to complicated cases getting really good results very quickly once they found the miasm and applied the totality correctly. It is suited as a methodology particularly to new practitioners when they haven't found their confidence yet they're a little overwhelmed by how many methodologies they've been taught they don't quite know where to go um, and it's just great. New practitioners have just come to us from all over the world and they've all been very happy with what they've learned. Um, students can start learning it, even at student level. Um, in our undergraduate course, which we don't run anymore, but we used to, we taught this to students. Once we realised how, um, how efficient it was, we couldn't not teach them at an earlier stage. And older practitioners, there's a number of older practitioners that have come to it. They're, they're open-minded, they recognise they're not getting all their cases, they might be getting a lot, but not all of them, or at least getting enough and they want to find a more simple methodology. It can actually make your clinical um, turnover quite quick. Once you get used to how to use it, it can take a small amount of time to get some pretty good results. Okay, so HFA has now just been made available within Radar Opus. Um, they've got grants, uh, the HFA books are in ebooks within that system, and there is a HFA remedy filter within Radar Opus, which is useful for repertorizing. I'll show you some examples of that coming up. So that's one of the pages out of Radar Opus that you'll see. You've got the books in there, Appearance and Circumstance the homeopathic facial analysis and soul and survival. And when you've done your repertorization, you click on one of those colored buttons and it'll once you've worked out the miasm of your patient and it will show you which remedies come through in the filter. So we're gonna give you some case examples. These are fairly simple cases, but um, we just uh, are looking at two cases, digestive issues, but just because people have digestive issues doesn't mean they're not suffering. You can have quite a lot of pain and both these two women present with digestive problems and they are suffering a lot and we find a remedy for them and it, and it really makes a big difference to their lives. So our process is that we take the case symptoms, then we repertorize with the focus on generals and modalities. We use the face to determine the dominant miasm of the patient. And then we apply the HFA filter to for the remedies, the HFA remedy filter, that should say, to highlight, highlight all the totality remedies that match that myosin for that patient. 
So our first case is a female, she's 26. She's been through the training part of the college between February and November 2019 and we haven't really got very far with her. So her case is re-looked at again and we'll show you the process how we worked out this case. So she's got a lot of bloating and swelling and distension. It can be really painful to the point where when she can, she's walking, she's doubled over with pain when it really starts to kick off. Um, she's worse for pressure generally, but she's okay if she lies on her stomach. She doesn't think it's related to eating um, and she's getting it at least once a week, a very bad bout. She says that in the past she's got rashes on her hands and feet, but only on holidays. And uh, there's not a lot of focus on that, but it's something we put down that came through the case. She gets headaches quite frequently. They're dull. They're in her temples, in the base of her head. Um, better after sleep. She's got a history of asthma and eczema. She's removed gluten from her diet. She's had a history of fainting and she's quite allergic to flowers, pollen, cats and dust. She can get nasal congestion, which is thick and stringy. Uh, her jaw is often stiff and painful and it clicks and cracks. She doesn't particularly like meat or eggs. She's a vegetarian and she has had some chilled lanes. So between February and November, a few remedies were tried, sulfur, bryonia, lycopodium. She'd also tried pulsatilla in the past. Minor changes to a case, not, not enough to be happy with. So her case is taken more specifically in November 2009. And we focus on what's going on in her life. And she's very busy. She's working in a high profile job. She's also studying, but she says she doesn't feel stress. She actually paints a picture of having a very high stress um, work life and study life, but she says she doesn't feel stressed at all. She's a very pragmatic, straightforward person, um, but she explains that this stomach pain is really bad. It's now one, if not two times weekly. Um, we ask, this is where we start to get the information that we're after. We're asking, well, tell us about the modalities. We have to explain what a modality is to the patient. Um, but with direct questioning, we can start to get those modalities. So she explains that the stomach pain is usually worse afternoon to evening. It is always better after sleep. It's worse if she moves. It's better if she's still. It's better if she lies down. She says that her muscles will tense and they feel quite constricted along with the bloating and the cramping. And as she had already mentioned, she can't walk. The pain is so bad. The headaches she describes is around the temples mainly and the base of the skull and they're worse during the day. The jaw, she says, is a clenching sensation. It's quite painful. It restricts her movements. The hay fever, her eyes will itch. She gets this sort of stringy mucus in her eyes and her throat is itchy. And mostly, of all the things she's worse for, she says dust is the worst. She also generally is worse in winter and she's had the chill blains. Okay, so let's just have a look at some of the facial features. We're not going to look at all the facial features, but just give you an idea of what we're looking at. So she has, um, on these two sketches, we see five psoric or yellow features. For her case, we actually look bet at between 14 and 16 features, but we're just gonna focus on the psora here. So she has this um, M-shaped hairline, which you see on the left sketch, and she has these downturned eyes. You can see the dotted lines there, which highlight that the outer um, edge of her eyelids drop down at a, sort of a 45 degree angle. That is one psoric point. She also has a higher ears and she has that sloped forehead that we showed you on the forehead images. And her chin is back from her line of her bridge. And this is one a psoric or yellow feature too. So just on those two um, looks at her face, front on and side on, we get five psoric points. So this is her actual facial chart. Um, from those 14 to 16 facial features, she had downturned eyes, an M-shaped hairline, her front teeth seated, um, sat in a prominent way, which is one point Sora. Her smile had um, a psoric uh, manifestation. You learn all about all these different features when you do the course. Um, she had forehead lines that were psoric. She had two lines between the eyes, which are psoric. Her um, upper forehead was quite sloped and there was a question mark as to whether the lines under her eyes were strong enough to count. So we gave her between seven and eight psoric points. She had a wider nose and her top lip and even her bottom lip were quite full. 
So she got two red points there or two psychosis points. In the syphilitic column, she has between five and six points. The hairline is high. She has a symmetry in her eyes, mouth and chin. Her bottom teeth were crooked. Her bridge was indented. Her eyes were quite wide set. These are all syphilitic uh, manifestations of um, directional force or structure. And there was a possibility that there was a curving there. But what we're seeing in this chart is that the dominance is Sora or yellow. We have a formula for dominance. It is one point or more ahead. Um, and in this case, the Sora was dominant. Despite the other features, the Sora is dominant. Now we're just looking at the repertorization for her case. So it's there are 10 rubrics that were applied to this case, which is quite a lot. And generally, we work between six and eight, but sometimes we'll extend to 10. So we looked at the eye discharges. You will see that there's a star next to this rubric. Within Radar Opus, you can collectively bring together a generalized rubric from all the smaller rubrics. So this eye discharges rubric is a collective rubric. Um, the pain in the jaws is also a collective rubric. Then we've got the chillblains. We've got the amelioration from sleep. We've got motion aggravates, lying ameliorates, that sensation of constriction, the ropey or tenacious or stringy um, mucus secretions, the winter being an aggravating time, and the dust was the modality that rated, rated the highest for her um, case. So the, you can see we've got a lot of remedies there. Arsenicum is covered, belladonna, calcarb, carbo veg, hepasulf, carb, nuxvom, fossac, phosphorus, pulsatilla, Roostox, sepia, and sulfur. So we would expect that one of those remedies will help her, but at this stage, that's a lot to look up. So we need that miasm filter. We know that her case is dominantly soric. We need to filter so that we're only seeing the soric remedies through the HFA system. So we apply the HFA yellow confirmed remedies filter, and we see that carboveg, carlicarb, pulsatilla, and sulfur are the four remedies that are covered by the totality and they're covered um, by the repertorization. So I can see a number of you asking, is this tuberculomyism? No, this is Sora. This is dominantly Sora because the face tells us so. Don't worry about the pathology, the face tells us it's Sora. Now we've just got to find a remedy that works. Um, there are no testing remedies coming through, so we're looking at these four remedies, carboveg, carlicarb, pulsatilla or sulfur. Now, she'd already been given um, pulsatilla and sulfur in the past, so we're really left with carboveg or carly carb as being one, either of those remedies we can choose. And what we do with our system is we don't preempt, we don't know which remedy is going to be better, we just know it will be one of those because it's repertorized and it will be one of those because of the miasm. Um, so what we do is we choose the carboveg because it's come up first. It's pretty much almost equal in a point tally. We're not interested in the strength of each rubric, just the fact that it's there at all. So she's given a cup of veg, 30C, twice daily. And remember, we're looking at, um, she's a very busy person. She has this bad stomach pain. She has headaches. She has jaw pain and hay fever. If we're going to draw her case down to four single points, they're the four things we're wanting to be looking at. We give a carbo veg, 30C, twice daily. This is November 2019. We uh, always look at cases at around the four-week mark. So the following month in December, she reports that her headaches are a lot better, which is great. She says the hay fever is reduced, but it's still there. So that's, that's okay. Um, but she says there's really no change with her stomach. The jaw tension has some improvement and the chill blains are not currently an issue. But the stomach is a problem here because this is a core problem for her. And we might say, well, perhaps if we wait a bit longer, but we know because that core problem really hasn't been touched. The remedy isn't quite right. It's done something. It's obviously resonating because it's a soric dominant remedy. It's resonating because it repertorized, but it's not quite close enough. So we changed the remedy. So remember, we look at our repertorization graph, the same one that we used back in November. We can just look at it again. We see we haven't tried Carly Carb. So we give her Carly Carb 30C twice daily. The, the actual posology, that's a whole subject in itself. Grant goes into that in, in the um, THA course. But this was chosen because it matched the stress that she's under. That's how we choose the potency and the frequency. We look at her case again in January 2020. 
And she says her stomach is much better, 90% improved. She is very happy. She's been putting up with this for a number of years. She's only 26, but she's had this for many years, this stomach pain. She's tried all sorts of things from the diet to naturopathic things, and she's tried everything she can think of to try and improve this stomach, but more or less it stayed the same until this remedy. 90% improvement, she is very happy. She says the headaches are even better than on the carbo veg. And the hay fever is better too, but there's still some problem with dust, she says, still a problem there. Okay, so remember the case again. We've given Carly Carb 30C twice daily. The stomach is much, much better, 90% improvement. The headaches are even better than on the carbo veg and her jaw is much more relaxed. The hay fever is still there, but only when there's dust. This is such a good result, but we just need to do something with that hay fever. So what we do is we say to her, continue with the Carly Carb 30C twice daily. But if you get a day where the hay fever is really causing you some trouble, just rapid dose the Carly Carb for a few hours just to see if it gives you some help. She does this and she reports back that it's fantastic. Just even an hour of rapid dosing and that hay, hay fever is gone. Um, she says everything's really good. That hay fever is 80% better. This is a really big improvement for her. The stomach, there are now no problems whatsoever, no headaches. And when she's asked about a jaw, she has forgotten that she even had that problem. And yet it was quite clearly there back in November and December. Um, she, the current status of this case is we suggested to continue with the dosing, to be in touch if there's any slip back, which has, there has been none. She's in lockdown like all of us around the world. She's continuing with her work um, and it's quite stressful for her, this high pressure work, working from home, but she's doing really well. And so we're very happy with that case. So that's just an example of the process, how we found the remedy, how we gave the remedy, how it worked for this patient. Okay, and we go back just to remind ourselves of that original repertorization with all the remedies from arsenicin all the way down to sulfur. And there was Carly Carb, I think number six. Um, the blue highlights, probably not the best color. We might ask Radar if they can get the HFA colors to match this view of looking at the um, charts. But the, the blue highlights are there just to show you that any of those six remedies had repertorized, but because she already had lycopodium and bryonia and sulfur and pulsatilla, we were only left with two. Um, possibly if this case had been done with these modalities a year earlier, um, we would have come to the Kali Carb much more quickly, but that's the process, that's how we did it. Okay, so now we're just asking the question, why do we use general rubrics? Well, we use general rubrics to make sure that our remedy doesn't get excluded from our repertory chart too early. Repertorization and repping, it's like casting a net to find the perfect fish. And you wanna bring in a lot of fish with a very wide cast to make sure your fish is in your net. If you use small rubrics, if you try to hone in too specifically too early, you can miss a good remedy because we know that you may not be seeing the case in its entirety. The remedy may not have been allocated in its entirety. There are a lot of reasons why we can miss a remedy, but the remedies are there. Your patient is giving you more than enough rubrics if you know how to use the generals. You will find that remedy if you cast a wide net. So then once you pour all those remedies in, we discard all the remedies that do not fit our profile. We have seven uh, miasms, so six sevenths of those remedies by miasm will not be the best remedies for the case. We discard them. So we only give remedies that match the totality of the case and the miasm of the case until we achieve a best outcome. And I'm just going to repeat the case is a sorry case because the remedy told us so and the face tells us so. Once you get used to the HFA miasm, you'll have a real confidence and you won't mix up other miasmatic methods. You'll be absolutely clear in your mindset what you're gonna to give to the patient and why. And you'll see them coming back through the door in that second or third month and they'll be very happy because you're really getting someone with their case. Let's have a look at case number two. This is our example. Another female, she's a little younger. She is uh, age 19 and her case symptoms are taken. We then repertorize with the focus on generals and modalities. And we look at her face to determine her dominant miasm. And then we filter out the remedies 
by applying the miasmatic filter. So we're left with a remedy that matches her totality and a remedy that matches her miasm. Okay, let's look at the case. So she also has stomach problems, but hers is a little different to the first case. She gets quite sick after eating. She's done a lot of conventional treatment. She's tried antibiotics with no change. She has no idea why she feels so sick. Um, the sickness can come anywhere from two minutes to two hours after she eats and she can't pinpoint any particular food. Um, but she has noticed if she overeats, she can get sick. However, sometimes it's even a snack and there can be some nausea there. In the last four months, she's just had sudden vomiting or a sensation as if she will vomit, generally worse on waking. Sometimes she goes from sitting to lying or to standing or leaning. So basically a change of position um, or rising up and that will bring on a sensation that she's going to vomit or she does vomit. She notices too that after a shower she may vomit or she just knows she's going to so she vomits in the shower because it's just easier to get it over and done with. Um, she just can't really manage this process very well. It's, it's really quite strong. She says about 80% of them are after dinner, more in the evening, but there's still quite a number of them are after lunch or even, even breakfast, but mainly after dinner. She vomits everything that's been eaten. Um, it was quite acidic, but not now. She's just vomiting everything she eats. It's worse also for drinking water, and she can get some burping with some acid at the back of the throat. Okay, she's also got headaches, similar to our first case. Um, often people with stomach problems have headaches. Um, she's had a CT scan, which tells that there's some sinus inflammation in her uh, headache profile. And she's used the antibiotics. She's got about 50% improvement, but it's not enough to get rid of it because we know that there's something constitutionally out. She's out of balance. Um, it's not enough just to take antibiotics. It might patch up for a short time, but it doesn't bring you back into balance. She's saying that the headaches are worse after a poor sleep or when she's stressed. She's getting between one and three headaches a week. They're always at her temples. Um, they may involve her neck and the back of her head. Uh, a lot of pain, it's a constant pain. Better for rubbing and worse after rising in the morning. She's also getting cold sores, one after the other on her lips. They kind of scab, then they grow, then they fall off, then they come back larger. She's been getting those and she's got some that she's just had in the last week or so as well. She has stress. I mean, you'll, you pretty much always see stress when you've got someone coming into the clinic with health problems. Her stress is a new job. She's starting college. Um, her boyfriend is working in another state. So she's got a lot going on and she's feeling pretty stressed. Okay, let's have a look at some of her features. Um, you can see her case is going to end up being a syphilitic or a blue case. And we will tell that from her face. So we see that she's got quite a high hairline, that's one blue or syphilitic point, and she's got quite a pointed chin shape, another blue or syphilitic point. Um, there are three things we pick up from the profile. We pick up that her forehead has a curved shape, we pick up that her bridge has an inward curved shape, and also that she has very small ears. We've determined that uh, where the ears are very small, that's one syphilitic or blue point. She actually has 12 to 13 features that we've used in total, but we're only for this webinar just going to show you these, these five, just to give you an idea of what we're looking at. So with her chart, she has actually no sorical yellow features at all, but she did have five psychotic or red features. Her nose, lips um, had psychotic um, feature presentation. Her hairline was straight. She had that line, that center line that we spoke of before. And the distance of her bridge is one point for psychosis. But she has seven points for syphilis or blue. Her chin, her asymmetry, her hairline is high. She has both inward and crooked teeth. She has the forehead shape, the bridge shape, and her ears are small, which we've already shown you. So because she has dominantly more syphilitic features on her face than the psychosis, and no sore at all, we want to give her a syphilitically dominant or blue remedy. Okay, so this is the repertorization. So remember the stars are sort of like super rubrics that are joined together from individual rubrics. We wanted head pain um, that's worse rising in, uh, from rising or rising in the morning, um, and there's 253 remedies there. Head pain in the temples, 456. Um, the head pain where the rubbing ameliorates, uh, the vomiting after drinking, 
uh, the vomiting after eating, the sudden vomiting, and um, something that resonates to after sleep. And we get pulsatilla, arsenicum, belladonna, sepia, rustox, uh, zinc, pedophilum, aethusia, um, a remedy I'm not familiar with, uh, tritic vegan, I think, or veg, I'm not sure what that remedy is, I was told, but I don't know that remedy, and vanilla, again, a remedy don't work with. So the, the first seven remedies from pulsatilla to aethusia we're familiar with, so we're looking at one of those remedies. Okay, we apply the filter because we know this is a blue or syphilitic case because of the face. We're not worried about the pathology. It's about the face. The face is telling us the dominant miasm. So we want the HFA blue confirmed remedies. And really, we've only got mercury there, plumbums not coming through in all rubrics or cantharis, bright is a little bit behind. So we're going to put another filter over this um, repertorization. When we put another filter over, you'll notice down the bottom we have some blue testing remedies. And one of the blue remedies we're testing is Aethusia. Um, this is another project we're working on where we're looking at the structure of plants and we're starting to realise we can read the structure of plants to work out their dominant myosin. This is going to expand our remedy choices a lot. And we have looked at the structure of Aethusia and it has dominantly syphilitic structure. So because that's the only remedy that covers all of the rubrics in our repertorization, this is the remedy we're going to give her. So remember the case, she has stomach problems, she has headaches, cold sores. Um, look, menses, she did have some menstrual problems which haven't been included in the case and she's suffering with stress. We give her Aethusia Sinapium 30C one time daily. Okay, this is in August last year. We talked to her um, in September. She says within a week of taking the remedy, she feels a real improvement. All her stomach symptoms are gone. She just had a few minor episodes. It's a dramatic change for her. She says there's a slight nausea after large meals, but when she just sticks with smaller meals, she's fine. Any acidity is gone. The burping is just occasional, just at an average level. She hardly has any headaches at all. The neck pain is gone. Uh, she did have a cold sore, but it went quite quickly. Um, a little small one appeared after a party night where she drank a bit of alcohol, but that's cleared up. She's had a bit of a cold, but she says she's moved through it really quickly. She's used to getting colds. They usually last quite a while. She moved through this one quite quickly. Okay, so we now get to October. She's still been on the Aethusia synapium once daily, 30C once daily. Her stomach is still going really well. She did throw up one time after she had a particularly big meal, but outside of that, nothing else. She doesn't feel so good after takeaway food. And this is just a common thing. This is an obstacle to cure. You cannot eat takeaway or excessively processed food and feel good. So we do always advise to look at those obstacles to cure. You need to eat fresh food. Um, so we do advise she needs to really focus on fresh food. She's 19, she's moved out of home, she's going to college. It's a little tricky for her, but she's going to give it a try. Um, however, despite that, the remedy's still done an extraordinarily good job. She's burping just a little bit, but nothing much. She has no headaches now. Her neck pain is gone, no cold sores, and just a very minor cough in the morning. In November, um, she is still doing really well. There's been a lot of stress. She's moved house. She's got another job. She still notices the processed food is a problem, but very little compared to before the remedy. She's still taking the remedy. It's keeping her in a good place. She has no headaches, no neck pain, no cold sores. Very occasionally a little cough. We're still advising her you need to eat as well as you can. It helps everybody to eat well. So this is naturopathic advice that every homeopath should still give their patients. Um, we want her to continue the remedy at the same dose. And then we get to February, so it's a few months later, and she advises us that she decided to stop the remedy in January. She felt she was staying really well, and we'd said this to her, that at some point, try stopping the remedy, see how you go without it. And she said she's just doing really well, no problems at all. Her stomach's settled, no headaches, no neck pain, no cold sores. And so that's an example on how we use the facial features to find the dominant miasm and the repertorization 
and the HFA filter to highlight which remedies belong to the HFA miasm. And just a reminder, that was our original uh, repertorization, and we knew we weren't going to give a pulsatilla or arsenicum or belladonna or sepia or rustox or zinc or pedophilum because each of those remedies belongs to a different miasm. It does not belong. That none of them belong to the to the um, syphilitic or the blue miasm. Only the aethusia had the potential, and we're now pretty confident that it does belong there. So we've worked that out via the case. We've worked that out via the structure of the plant. So HFA is a very exciting system. It, it is opening up homeopathy to us at a level that that is really unprecedented for us. Um, we're extremely happy with the results. Our patients are happy. And the process, once you learn the face and you learn how to repertorize using generals, which I think most of us are taught in year one homeopathy, um, we can just get back to that broad way of looking at things. We can find remedies quite quickly. But you must have a good repertorization package. So just to finish up, um, the course that um, the Homeopathic Academy has um, joined with us. We recorded this course in Delhi in 2019. Um, most of that course is available now. We've just got a few finalising points to go on it that will be done this week. And then all the classes are available. You can start with Grant Bentley's classes, the 10. They've been available for a couple of months. And he covers the physical body and miasms, um, physical generals, the history of facial structure, um, modalities, causation and individualization, case taking, methods, stress and self energy, uh, repertorizing and polycrests, miasm theory, uh, case management, dosing, remedy reactions and adaptation. So a lot of information there, which is all the basis of the HFA um, methodology. So it's really important to understand these points. It's uh, important to understand how to case managed properly as well. So you not only learn how to work at the miasm, but you must, once you've found the right remedy, know how to give it and know how to continue its action. Then there are the 10 classes that I've done, um, focusing on how the HFA model developed. Um, the seven miasms, the face, how to take photos. A very, very important part of this process is to learn how to take photos. We have a specific set of photos that must be taken and you need to take them properly. It's quite easy to do once you've learned it, but it must be done properly. How to recognize and allocate features. Um, and we have face examples, many, many face examples from every part of the face, every miasm and how they're allocated. And then we have case examples. So the two courses are really important if you want to learn HFA properly. Uh, and then if you want to go even deeper, you can come over to our um, website, which is vcch.org for the Victorian College of Classical Homeopathy. And we have a lot more information there as well. So you can start with the THA course and then you can go even deeper and learn more. But the THA course is very comprehensive. It will take you to where you need to go. And if you're experienced in repertorizing and you can take on these concepts quite quickly, you will see um, your casework really start to um, improve at a rapid uh, rate. So thank you for your time. I'm going to bring Grant back on now and um, it's going to be question and answer time. Lewis and Grant, thank you so much for updating the audience on this uh, very unique and latest approach on the diagnosing of the remedies on the miasmatic aspect. I feel very gratitude towards you both the speakers to update uh, an aspect to updating our audience for uh, this new concept. I believe that our, our audience would like this idea and uh, in a coming time, they would try to apply this particular concept in their practice too. Meanwhile, if you proceed further, I, I also want to update the audience that if in case they have queries over the homeopathic facial analysis, they can visit on the website uh, www.thehomeopathicacademy.com. So if in case at any point you have any questions, so you don't understand any part, so we have a full uh, information on this particular topic through our course. Uh, you can review, uh, you know, you can know about the speakers and you can know about the particular course. So we have this homeopathic facial analysis course uh, with the name Mastering the Clinical Methodology of HFA and the Practical Application of Facial Analysis for Miasmatic Diagnosis by Grant and Louis Bentley. And uh, dear doctors, I also want to update you all that the first module of this particular course we have put it free for you all so that you can come to know that how with the help of this visual and audio aid 
you can easily understand this very unique concept and help uh, yourself at uh, diagnosing the remedies on miasmatic aspect so do have a look kindly visit on this website meanwhile uh, before uh, we close the session let us come on this question and answer uh, session so dear louis and grant we have some very interesting question and answer for you so just be ready i take one by one and uh, let me put to you and please answer them okay so uh, we have a uh, we get a mixed response uh, first of all dear uh, grant and louis uh, maximum audience is wants to know what if in the situation if uh, they are diagnosing a remedy there are two possibility uh, if in case they are noting the miasma on the face then definitely they would uh, take the assistance of hfa otherwise if in case they are getting the remedy on as a whole i mean on the whole constitution and any other remedies appearing on the miasmatic aspect so uh, uh, what remedy they should be thought of whether they should go for the whole constitution or they just stick to the homeopathic facial analysis the 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 constitutional is what we're after i mean but a constitutional remedy is is the remedy that's doing more than two or three complaints at any one time that that that's kind of a constitutional remedy is something where you're treating it rather than you're treating it acute illness and the base of hfa well the basis of homeopathy is if you're if you're in a state of stress you're in a state of fight or flight yes. being in that the Bye. energy is is going all into this state of uh, fight or flight this state of protection and some of the vo more vital organs are being denied and so as a result of that if they're denied of the energy for too long they begin to show signs and symptoms and then begin to show breakdown that's how our remedies work we give a a a, a packet of energy which the body likes and nice. up the and uh, and fixing up these deprived areas good so any remedy any remedy that we choose for a patient is going to be constitutional by definition because we are including into it the whole totality of that of the patient's signs and symptoms so in that sense it is constitutional if you're talking about a constitutional remedy that hasn't been miasmatically allocated um, then it, we would always probably choose something which is constitutional and known rather than constitutional and unknown um, but after that if if um, if that didn't achieve anything then we might move on and we might choose something that doesn't have an hfa allocation yet but we would always use something uh oh is a miasmatic remedy first yes yeah, so i think i'm watching some of the questions on the side and i understand that it can be really confusing but remember what a lot of those questions are highlighting to us that you're mixing your miasmatic methodology okay this is this will take you to a new place where you trust physical structure beyond pathology you trust it more than acute presentations you will completely and utterly trust the face the face will tell you the miasm so for that, that both those two cases that were shown even though the mind symptoms were not taken into account both of those patients experienced a really Included, neither of them had mind issues. They felt happy enough within themselves, but they had stomach problems or headaches. So we've we've met the criteria of constitutional because we've touched their constitution through those physical presentations. Grant does a lot of cases in his clinic, particularly where there's a lot of um, emotional and mind pathology, um, particularly um, children who have psychiatric disorders and so forth. And we still use the same methodology. 
And if the remedy is right, it'll start to touch the patient at all levels. That is constitu constitutional. Um, so uh, that is what we we believe that our remedy that matches the face is constitutional. It is miasmatic. But if you have a different interpretation of a miasm, perhaps you just need to think about it differently. Really, you need to test. Once you test, you will start to see how incredibly efficient this system is and that you don't need to delve deeply to try and differentiate a patient via their mind or their emotions. You can differentiate via their modalities and their miasm by face. Yes, well said and well explained, Louis and Brian. Uh, I have one more question for you. Uh, Dr. K. S. Verma is asking uh, about the uh, what about the HFA versus genetic disposition? So, can you speak on that? Can you repeat yes. that question? Please? Yeah, the question is uh, what about HFA versus genetic disposition? genetic disposition. The homeopathic facial analysis versus genetic disposition. So is there any relation or anything would you want to comment on that? Your genetic disposition in the sense in reference to it, it look it I, I think in some way in how homeopathy works. Genetic genetic predisposition show is is essentially from a homeopathic perspective the sum total of all your strengths that we and so what you're really looking at there is that if you go into a state of where you're working too hard, you're burning up your vital force, you're burning up that vitality, or you're in a state of stress, state of anger, you're in a state of grief, whatever that may be, when you are using your vital force inappropriately for self-defense or whatever it might be, then whatever your whatever areas of the body are already genetically a little weaker, they rely on an extra amount of energy to keep them at optimal level. Now, if they can't get that extra bit of energy, they are going to be the first areas of the body which start to show the wear and tear of, of what's been going on. So in that sense, HFA doesn't have so much, it doesn't show you what your weaknesses are going to be. But what it does do is that it's, it helps you supply the remedy that your body is going to need and, and that energy that it's lacking. You can't just pick up any bottle out of the pharmacopoeia and just, I mean, the pharmacy and just give it to somebody and it needs to be specific. And the reason that it has to be specific is that it has to resonate to your vital force. So your vital force in that, is, in that sense is the purpose of the vital force is to keep the body in harmony and it's also to, to try and protect you. And it has, as Hahnemann talks about, it has, it's, uh, he talks about it being unintelligible, meaning that it's a program, right? It's pre-programmed to do so, right? So if you're talking about what, what differentiates a SORIC remedy is not the fact that it has skin conditions. It's not the fact that it has irritation. It's the fact that the vital force will deal with stress in the same manner all the time. And that manner, if you're SORIC, is centrifugal. It will try and protect the inner vital core by throwing any stress and disease out onto the periphery. And so what we do, that's, that's the genetic predisposition, is the vital force you inherit. And so what HFA does is that it, it tells us as a practitioner that this patient in front of us has a centrifugal acting vital force. So we need a centrifugal remedy to double up on that vital force's action of self-protection and harmony. That's how it works. And I can see... Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Grant. And I can see... A yeah, Louise, please speak. Yes, I can see a question there. How do you do online uh, clinic? Well, uh, we do online clinic almost exclusively. Um, the patients in our clinic are from all countries as well. We have a lot of in the United States, um, in Europe, 
and all we apply this method for all those people uh, we do their facial analysis via photos that they send in advance so for every case we do we um, do a pre facial structure through photos that are sent we have very specific instructions on what photos need to be sent and, and what we need to look at and they send a health performer as well then pre-analysis and just finalize those modalities through the case taking um, and then we're able to choose a remedy that helps them and in regard to acute miasms we don't see this model as being applicable there we see that a person gets an acute illness and we have two choices we can either build up their uh, energetic constitution through giving them more of the remedy that's working for them already or we can just choose a remedy that's an acute remedy you know like for chicken pox or measles or whatever but um, there is no reason not to try the first uh, method that is to build the constitution up during the acute phase it can be a very effective way of throwing off an acute um, and we use that with the face um, and the remedy that's already been chosen for them or another close remedy that matches the symptoms of the acute um, yes so it's, it's important to understand that homeopathy is is a dual model right so we all know about the repelling action. We know about Hahnemann gives that sort of example about two poles of the magnets and the stronger one is the one that repels the weaker one and so on. We understand about that repellent action of getting a remedy that has the same resonance as whatever may be the virus or parasite that's trying to invade. And our stronger remedy, because we can alter it via the dynamization process, becomes stronger than the, the invading bacteria or the invading virus. But there's also another way that you could do that if you already know the, the constitution of the patient. Now, for example, if we suddenly got a phone call or an email from that patient who was the Aethusa patient who was very sick with an, an acute disease, what we can do to bide us some time, and sometimes it's even all that's needed to get through, and this has been where the clinic has taught me, I wouldn't have thought this necessarily. But what you can do is if you've got a good constitution, you can rapid dose that constitution. So instead of trying to repel something out of the body, you're trying to replenish the energy of that, of that constitution so it is fit and strong enough to be able to fight back and not be so overcome. And that works really well as well. And I can see a question there about children and their changing faces. And it's true, our faces do change, but our myas, our directional force stays the same for life. Even if we develop new lines or our ears change a little or our nose or our mouth, and we see these changes, the miasm is still dominant. And you can read it even in babies. It is a little harder to read in babies because their teeth haven't come in yet. And have much hair, that sort of thing. But we have treated babies successfully, constitutionally. As I say, the earliest we've done was four days old. And that miasm, that child is now coming up seven. Um, the, the two remedies we've chosen for that child consistently work for acute and uh, any sort of uh, behavioural problems, anything that those those remedies just pull that child back in the balance as they did four days old um, and then the child doesn't need anything for a while until another stress occurs and off we go. So it becomes um, really easy clinically once you find that facial um. and you find the one, two or three remedy that that patient really resonates to the most, you just choose the one that matches the best for that particular situation. Pretty good. I'm just going to add one more thing also to this. I can see there's a question there from, from Ruth wondering about how we do the facial structure for online consultations. We don't actually do it, the facial structure online. We will do the case taking uh, and case management online. But the facial part, we get you to do that with 
photo use those photos to us and we analyze them individually or we do the completion with you so we have it all up front i think that's about all isn't it we have quite a number of students who do online consultations um each of that it's very easy to use in an online setting you just need that information in advance like grant just mentioned and i spoke about before um and i think um uh, yeah, Lewis and Grant, you answered the queries very well, and I believe that the audience have get the answer in aspect of uh, every query. They have the doubts over the changeability of the phase. They have the questions whether they should uh, choose the remedy from the constitutional as a whole aspect or they just focus on the phase. But uh, you answered well, and uh, I believe audience that you are now well acquainted with the answers and your doubts in this aspect is well cleared. I also want to update you all that if in case you have further queries, then kindly make use of the course which we have put it over the Homeopathic Academy. And the good thing is that during this lockdown, we have provided 30% discount on the course. So it's a very good opportunity to learn the uh, homeopathic facial analysis through the visual uh, uh, audio aid and come to know how the different characteristic on the face of each man can be studied out and try to implement in the practice and uh, this is a kind of a tested uh, module or kind of a tested uh, uh, concept which uh, dr grant and louis has already doing from so many years so i as a homeopath feel that you also find the results if in case you go through the proper literature and try to implement in the clinic so this is uh, a kind of a request and suggestion to you all dear audience have a look we have all the possible ways to read the literature we have the information through the books which uh, Grant and Louis well uh, uh, put it uh, in their uh, literature part. Then we have the information in the radar opus. You can, if in case you want to make use of technology, so we have a map and now we have the literature in radar opus of uh, Grant and Louis where you can make use of the technology to understand this homeopathic facial analysis. And if in case you find difficulty in understanding the concept, then we have put it the homeopathic course on the homeopathicacademy.com make use of the offer, get 30% discount and just start learning it. And believe me, this will help you in the long run. When you come to know that for a particular case, you are easily able to find the remedy on the miasmatic aspect and you are getting the better results. So with this note, uh, let, uh, let me conclude the webinar. And before closing this session, I would like to thank our speakers for sharing their precious time and updating the audience. Uh, uh, dear Grant and Louis, uh, Thank you so much for being on the THA platform and sharing this wonderful concept. We feel very obliged for you and uh, today feel proud that we come to know about many new things in aspect of the prescribing the remedy on miasmatic aspect. On the behalf of THA and BGN group, I would like to thank you for giving THA your, your valuable time. My heartful thanks all goes to our learners, not just those who have been with us for the last one, uh, one or two hours, but uh, also those who have been watching us following us on social media accounts and the visitors on THA website, the homeopathicacademy.com.